I'm State Representative Seth Grove. Uh, welcome to uh, wonderful Dover Borough, Dover School District. Appreciate um, the school district hosting this important event. And ironically, one of the first meetings uh, I've ever held as a legislator back in 2009, I brought in all my school boards, I brought the Pennsylvania State Employee Retirement System down, and we discussed pensions. And here we are in 2014 discussing pensions. Uh, Paramount, probably the, the, the number one issue facing state government, facing municipalities, facing counties, uh, not only here in Pennsylvania, but across the country. Uh, if you would just do a go ahead home, do a Google search, or obviously with smartphones today, do a go Google search now of pensions, uh, you will see dire circumstances uh, across the entire country. Uh, it's not unique to Dover, it is not unique to 196 District, it is not unique to York County or South Central Pennsylvania, it is a Pennsylvania issue. Uh, between school districts and state uh, pension systems, uh, there's an unaccrued, unfunded liability about $50 billion. Uh, you heard the song, if I had a million dollars, if I had a $50 billion, um, should probably be that quote for this meeting. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do this is, unfortunately, there's a lot of um, discussion with pension reform, with different plans. So instead of uh, having outside sources kind of dictate the policy, I thought I'd bring in my good friend, Mike Tobash, uh, state representative from Schuylkill County. That's right, 125th. The uh, fighting 125th district. <laughs> That's right. um, he was elected actually the session after I was. Um, he represents the House Republican Caucus on the Employee Retirement Commission, the PERC Board. Uh, PERC Board has a very important role in that any kind of pension plan, any kind of amendment, they have to do the actuarial analysis for it. Uh, um, he also uh, was involved in, in, in many uh, hearings on pension reform moving through because of his role in that process. Um, we, last budget cycle, not this last one, but one before, uh, both the House and Senate did have a full defined contribution plan in front of them. Uh, the PERC board came out that it may have had a cost increase because of the transition cost of moving from a DC plan to a DB plan and shutting off the old DB plan kind of froze pension reform, uh, moving to a kind of like a four, full 401k plan. Uh, it, it, it just completely froze us because we weren't sure if it would be a you know, billion dollar increase to the pensions or a billion dollar decrease to the pension system. So with that kind of analysis, you can't make a good fundamental decision moving forward. So through the summer, uh, Mike worked with the prime sponsor, Warren Kampf, on a, um, what we're gonna, what he's gonna review here. It's a hybrid plan. It's a DC, DB component. Um, and just to preface this, how we kind of got in this mess. So it really started with Act 9, 2001. The legislature decided to give pension increases to all state employees, the General Assembly, everybody. Uh, and it was done retroactively, so it automatically increased the cost of the pension system before the ink was dry. Obviously, that was 2001. Uh, terrorist attack, we had a financial collapse 2001. We had another one in 2008. Uh, added. Uh, to the unfunded liabilities moving forward. We had a point in Pennsylvania history where the pension systems were doing very well. So school districts and, and the Commonwealth both decided, you know, the pensions are doing so well, let's not put any new money into the pension systems. At one point, the state's allocation was zero. I don't think school districts ever really got down to zero, but that percentage did drop, and that was used for more spending in other areas of the budget. Um, you know, employees uh, have always paid their 7.5% into the pension system moving forward, and uh, they will continue to do that. Um, so, you know, as taxpayers, as employees, as school district employees, state employees, everybody has a vested interest in getting this right and uh, respecting everybody's point of view in this process. So, uh, without further ado, uh, Mike Tobash and the uh, Tobash Plan for Pension Reform. Thanks, yeah. Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Thank you. And I'm, look, I'm happy and I'm honored to be here. Uh, we are going around the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and we're talking about this crisis that we find ourselves in. Uh, and I appreciate my distinguished colleague, Seth Grove, inviting me uh, here this evening. And I appreciate you all taking some time. You know, I think it's just so important that we try and dispel a lot of misinformation that's out there right now, give people the facts. Uh, it's my belief that when the chips fall where they will, where they should, that we're going to have meaningful pension reform in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, so I appreciate uh, my colleague inviting me here this evening, and I appreciate you guys all taking time from a, you know, a beautiful evening uh, here in York County to listen to some information. And you know, I want to make this as interactive as we can. We'll have a discussion, and hopefully people will be able to leave here this evening with a good basic knowledge of what the problem is and what the solution is that we're offering uh, and help us uh, 
do the grassroots work that we need to introduce meaningful pension reform to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Now, Seth had mentioned uh, that we had a song here, If I Had a Million Dollars, and I was listening to it the other day on the radio. It was just on the radio when I was moving from one place to another, and I thought, wow, that's kind of a, uh, an apropos song because we got a, a lot of debt here in the Commonwealth. And when I did that, I thought back about the, to the budget that we had just passed. We've got a couple of line items in our budget. It's a big budget, $29.1 billion. And um, we've got some line items in there. One, if you're talking about education, the mobile science and math uh, lab, which I talk to my school districts, I think it's an important line item. It's about $866,000, uh, just a little bit less than a million dollars. And uh, I saw that we've got a line item in there, $998,000, and that's a public safety item. It's municipal police training. Um, so a million dollars, it's a lot of money funds important programs uh, within our budget, but a uh, billion dollars is almost unconscionable to many people. Do you know how long we could fund those million dollar line items if we had a billion dollars? Anybody a mathematician in here? Uh, a million dollar line item could be funded for, Seth, a thousand years. A billion dollars is a thousand million dollars. And we've got a $50 billion unfunded liability in our pension systems in the Commonwealth. It is the biggest problem that we've got in our state budgets moving forward that will affect us for the next 30 years and beyond if we don't get a grip on this, on the, on this situation. So the plan that we've proposed is a hybrid pension plan. And as Seth mentioned, uh, there, there's been a proposal, uh, and a proposal in some other states as well as Pennsylvania to move to move to a plan that, that is largely favored in the, in the private sector, and that's a 401k type plan, a defined contribution plan, where once the employer makes the payment, they have no more liability. It's then managed by the employee, and that's what happens in the private sector. And we took a look at a plan like that. As he mentioned, my colleague Warren Kampf uh, had a house bill, and it was switching to a straight defined contribution plan we got a perk note on that. It talked about the cost associated with walling off our existing plan, and it turned out to be tens of billions of dollars more to make that transition. So through the hearings, through a lot of work with my colleagues, including Seth, some people in the Senate, some people in the House, some people in the administration, we've come up with a hybrid pension approach, which, which basically does this. It keeps open the defined benefit plan that we've got right now, but shifts it over to defined contribution over a period of time. And by doing that, we could get rid of some of these transition costs. And the actuaries have weighed in that we've got substantial savings under this method. The plan is for new employees coming into the Commonwealth. As I mentioned, it would introduce the first mandatory defined contribution or 401k type pension plan for public employees in the Commonwealth. It will not change benefits for current employees Another thing that the plan is designed to do is to rescue the benefits of people who are already retired from the system and the people that are in the system right now. As I mentioned, the fact of the matter is that we are so underfunded that there is a belief that current employee pension benefits are in jeopardy. I can tell you if you've seen the news, you've just seen in Detroit, there was a judge that made a ruling the other day that retired employees will take a 4.5% decrease in their pension benefits. Retired employees work for their entire career. They will now be getting a decrease in their pension benefits. The plan is designed to do four basic things. And the four things are this. Number one, to reduce costs moving forward. Number two, to, to develop savings. Four actuarial firms have weighed in on what the savings are and the savings are between 11 and $16 billion over the projection period. And as I mentioned, a billion dollars is a lot of money. This plan develops savings. Number three, to shift risk away from the taxpayer of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. If you've got a defined benefit pension system, the employer, inevitably the taxpayer, is on the hook for those payments. If we shift over to a 401k or defined contribution model, we shift some of that risk away from the taxpayer. And number four,
The plan is designed to provide adequate and sustainable benefits for future hires moving forward. It's designed to introduce realistic, not make-believe pension policy into the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the four basic things that we're trying to accomplish. Let me tell you about what the plan does not do. And there's a lot of speculation. You know, I hear a, a lot of conversation. Well, the plan doesn't do this, and it doesn't do that, and it doesn't do the other thing. I can tell you, it does not immediately eliminate the unfunded liability. We've got $50 billion of debt. There's no magic wand, there's no silver bullet that will automatically erase $50 billion of debt. We have to thoughtfully work ourselves out of this hole. You know, the idea that if you dig a hole for yourself, the first thing you need to do when you're in deep debt is to quit digging. And this plan does that, but we don't snap our fingers and get rid of $50 billion of debt. Number two, offer immediate budgetary relief. You may have heard this, that we're in this situation for a number of reasons, and Seth talked about them, but one of the reasons that we're in this situation that he mentioned is we've kicked the can down the road. In other words, we weren't making our payments. If you had a credit card bill and you expected to get out of debt quickly by just paying the minimum payment, we all know you would not get out of debt quickly. Well, we're not even making the minimum payment at this point in time. Act 120 of 2010 has us on a schedule and we're ramping up quickly, but that quick increase in the pension costs for school districts and taxpayers is putting a lot of stress on our budgets. And because we're not at that point where we're paying the annual required contribution, the ARC, okay, it does not give immediate budgetary relief. What we need to do is get on a path that we're paying a required payment and in order to do that, we need to make sure that we're as lean as we can be, that we're cutting expenses where we can, and quite frankly, we, we may have to look for additional revenue sources. Issues with underfunding, we've talked about it. Job creation, education, taxes. You know, it wasn't too long ago that Seth Grove came to our the district that I represent, Schuylkill County, and I represent a portion of Berks County, and somebody here mentioned to me Sam Rohr, who was a big proponent of property tax reform and elimination on my way in, okay? And Seth came to the district, and I know that he's got important and meaningful legislation to try and take away some of the property tax burden on citizens. You know, school districts need to, at certain times, increase property taxes, and there's an Act I index that says you can only raise property taxes to this index so that schools don't get out of control and don't raise it beyond taxpayers' ability. But there's a couple of reasons, a couple of exceptions. They can raise it higher than the index. And you know what one of those exceptions is? Pension liability. They can increase it above the Act I index for pension costs. And believe me, those costs are coming at us in a very rapid fashion. Financial stability. I don't know if anyone has seen the news, but uh, Pennsylvania just, just got downgraded in their bond rating, okay? You know, what does that mean? You know, I don't know. Okay, we got downgraded in our bond rating. I'll tell you what it's like. It's like having a mortgage at 6% and the bank calls you up and said, you know what, it's not 6% anymore, now it's 7.5. We have to pay more for the money, for the debt that we have in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So our bonds are a little bit more risky. They're more risky because these bond rating agencies take a look at Pennsylvania and they sincerely question our ability to pay back this massive pension debt. And until we get a grip on it, they will continue to put pressure on us and it's gonna cost more for us to borrow money. The higher cost of borrowing is gonna come out in the form of other budgetary problems. The problem. What and why we the people owe a staggering amount for the benefits that we've promised. I've said it, I need to continue to say it. We owe it as taxpayers, we owe the, we owe the bill. Now we gotta find a way to get out of it. We gotta find a way to pay it. The difference between employee contributions plus investment returns is what we owe because we have a defined benefit program that is basically just this, it's number of years of service times a multiplier times final salary is the amount we owe. As Seth mentioned, employees made their contributions. A couple of things happened, okay? Number one, in 2001, 
we retroactively increase benefits. We, meaning whoever's in the legislature at that time, voted because the plans were flush with cash. They increased benefits. Was it a good decision? Was it a decision I would have made? Look, in hindsight, it was a bad decision, okay? Number one, increasing benefits. Number two, the market didn't fare as well. You know, we just got out of this period of time that was characterized as the Great Recession. Okay, so if we have an assumed rate of return of 7.5%, we do less than that, who owes it? The taxpayers owe it. And then lastly, during that period of time, because the funds, the, the funds were flush with cash, there was a decision made for quite a number of years not to pay the amount that we should have paid into the system. So those three things came together to have us underfunded. And who owes it? The taxpayer owes it. The investment returns that we're earning were far less than we hoped, just as I mentioned. How? You know, basically this is it. This is just like anybody's personal retirement plan. We're retiring and we didn't save enough money. We didn't put enough money into the systems. Number two, when we did save, we didn't get the rate of return that we hoped for. And number three, we set some retirement goals that weren't realistic. So we bumped up those benefits retroactively, and now we're in a bad spot. You know, when I talk to different people about their pension program, it's a funny thing, and this is one of the arguments. Well, this plan doesn't do this, it doesn't do that, it doesn't do the other thing. But you know, when I talk to groups of people, when I talk to individuals, okay, and talk to them about what pension reform is to them, you can oftentimes get a different answer. For some people, it's pay me what you owe me. So if there's someone in the system right now and they're concerned about, you know, they got two years till retirement, they're worried about getting paid back what was promised to them. Number two, my budget is broken and if I don't get cash now, other things will suffer. We've talked about it. We're in a school district right now and this increase in employer contribution is putting pressure on the budgets of school districts and the Commonwealth. Number three, keep my spending dollars strong. As I mentioned, someone who's retired and haven't, hasn't had an increase in benefits or payment for many years, might feel the pinch of inflation on their retirement dollars, they're looking for a cost of living increase. The financial future of the state is in grave danger. We just talked about a bond downgrading. The debt is the root of all of the above. I can tell you if we didn't have this huge debt, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. In 2001, the plans were roughly 134% funded. At that point in time, we weren't talking about pension reform, we were talking about giving more benefits. But let me tell you what pension reform is to me. Pension reform to me is a reasonable, sustainable, realistic benefit moving forward, just like Act 9 of 2001, when we changed the direction on a path to get us $50 billion in debt, we need to change back to a system that will start to work our way out of the problem. So pension, okay, pension change for me is changing the benefits that we're promising people moving forward. If we can change those benefits to have something that's not make-believe pension policy, something that's reasonable, sustainable, and realistic, we can start to work our way out of this hole. I can tell you that people have coalesced around this plan. I think this is the favored plan by the majority of the body, but look, it all boils down to votes from individual representatives and senators from individual districts. That's one of the reasons that I'm out here tonight, to talk to you and to try and dispel any rumors about this plan and to try and build support so we get across the finish line. It's not as easy as I'd like it to be, and it's not as fast as many of us would like it to be, but I think we're getting closer every day. Yeah, so some, some political background on your question, I think is what you're looking for. Um, so we had this on the floor. We had, was it 15? 14. 14, 14 House Republicans vote with the Democrats to put this back in the Health and Human, or the Human Services Committee, which has nothing to do with pensions, but the person who proposed the uh, motion to do that was the chairman of the Human Services Committee. Uh, we were able to leverage it out of there because he, was, he wasn't going to move, he was just going to leave it go. So we were able to leverage him, bring it back on the House floor. Uh, before we, the budget broke, the Senate did move a bill. They, they tried to get <coughs> votes for a more comprehensive plan. Uh, for some reason they did it. They got 50 votes to put um, basically all elected officials into a D.C. plan upon re-election. 
uh, that's over in the House. I don't know. If, I don't know if they put that in state government committee. I don't know what committee specifically that is, but they did pass that 50 to nothing. Uh, what we're trying to do in the House right now is to get a comprehensive approach to it. Um, I know Mike and I tell us I, I'm 100% supportive of that Senate version. You know, if we have to start with the General Assembly, let's start with the General Assembly. Keep working at it. Um, it it's, it's a political theory to get it done. But I think we are trying to get something much more comprehensive on the books because even the General Assembly alone is a very small fraction of the overall uh, problem within pensions. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, our, our Senate colleagues support pension reform. Um, I think if, if we were able to um, get this across the goal line, get it over the Senate, they'll take it up, pass it, get it over the governors, but the, the key is moving forward. And again, you know, out of, you need 102 votes, you know, there's 111 House Republicans, 13 voted against it. So simple math, we need to work with our colleagues, specifically those 13, to say this is, this is important. So we get three of them, we're gonna get it. Democrats aren't voting for this. It's election year, governor's on top of the ticket. It's all political. And we've had conversations with some of my colleagues that are across the aisle that are Democrats, and they really don't have a problem with this, but you know what, we're, we're unified, we're not voting for it. We can take it up with somebody else next year, potentially. Because again, a lot of the arguments are Act 120 will work and we need to continue to that work. I would disagree. I would say Act 20 was predicated on short-term spending increases, not substantial pension reform moving forward. So. Sadly, if someone is making a vote based on politics and putting the future of the Commonwealth in Pennsylvania in jeopardy because they're worried about someone getting elected again, that's not the right thing to do. That's not why those mm -hmm. people were elected, and that's not the conversation we should be having. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So we hear the argument, hey, look, the plan doesn't go far enough. Again, so the question becomes, okay, what plan goes far enough? You know, what if we went to a straight, what if we, what if on a day we stopped offering pension benefits to all state and public school employees, right? Does that go far enough? You could do it. I mean, contractually, we don't have to offer benefits to people moving forward, but we still got this huge, massive, unfunded liability, okay? And you're right, on the governor's website, it says that we will grow to $65 million if we, don't change the, if we don't change direction. The fact of the matter is this pension bill changes direction. It lowers costs. It saves between 11 and $15 billion. Does that mean the job's done? No. We're going to have to do additional things. I mean, I mentioned it before, and I have to tell you that there's not going to be many people that stand up in favor of tax increases. Okay, but we've got to find additional revenue sources to pay for the liability that we owe right now. Can property taxpayers bear it? I think the answer is no. If I'm in this school district, if I'm in school districts in Schuylkill or Berks County, property taxpayers have had it up to here. The first thing we need to do is change direction. We've got to stop digging a deeper hole. We need to develop savings in the plan, and then we need to, we need to take a look at ways to raise revenue to make sure that we're paying for the benefits that have owed so far. I have to tell you that I've looked at this to the point that it is maddening, but just like any household that has got a huge mortgage and has racked up their credit card bills, what's the solution? It needs to be a, a thoughtful step-by-step -step approach, and the first thing is stop spending on those credit cards, lower costs, and start to work our way out of the situation. If there was a, if there was a way we could snap our fingers and get out of the $50 billion of debt, we would have done it, but it's more difficult than that, and this is a first step. Yeah, and I would, I would again, come back to Act 120 that was passed in 2010 under Rendell. It had substantial savings, billion dollars of savings, but what they did is create a collar, so they deflated their pension payments for a few years to try to smooth it out. 
what that does is take any long-term savings, front load it, and exacerbates the problem. It, it, literally, it, it literally pushes off the problem for a few years. Uh, the other problem with Act 120 is there was no 401k style component mixed in with it. It's still that DB system that we kept in place. You know, had, had this been put into place in, in 2010, I think we'd be in a better scenario today. And then obviously the collars were put in place and that's something the governor supported. He wanted to do collars in this year's budget, basically not paying the bills. We said, no, we're gonna pay our bills and we paid our bills without raising taxes uh, on the Commonwealth, on, 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 on taxpayers here. Um, so I, I think it's important to point out that this is a, this is a huge shift. Um, finally getting that 401k concept built into our pension plan. Do we need to go to the full DC? Yes, but we need to be smart about it. You know, the DC plan we had on the house floor, two out of three actuaries said it increased uh, costs by billions of dollars and then who bears those costs over the long term. So this plan is designed to reduce taxes in the long run. Okay, does this have an immediate effect on tax reduction? The answer to that is no, because we're not yet paying the amount that we need to pay to get out of this debt for the next three years, okay? Once we get to that point, and in, through the long term, this will reduce taxes because it saves between 11 and $15 billion over the current system that we're in right now. And those savings will come out in the form of reduced taxes in the future. Think of this as a structural change to the benefit. You have your current benefit that continue to project that out. It's just non-sustainable. Um, this, this, the benefit structure we have today was predicated upon state employees making far less than their private sector um, companion jobs. So the attractiveness is to come to the, 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 the public side was good benefits, good pension. That's changed drastically over the past few years. So as salaries have increased, we're now in line with, with public sector. Public sector had those lower benefits here. So in the public sector, we've had kind of the, the, the best of both worlds. That's resulting in the, 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 the massive increases in budgets, local property tax at the local level. What this does is restructure that benefit to be realistic, to be in the 21st century, provide portability, <laughs> and reduce those long-term effects to taxpayers. I want to thank you again yeah. for, being, for being so attentive. I want to yeah. thank you for understanding the issue, and I want to thank you in advance for letting your friends and neighbors and, and senators and representatives know how important this is for the future. I want to thank Seth for inviting me here this evening, and uh, a future member, I think, of the House, Kristen Hill, is joining us this evening, uh, who's doing her homework on all the issues, and, we had a chance to grab a bite deep before we came over here, so thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, and I'll stay as long as you want for questions, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm.